Let's take a look at the man called Jesus Christ. If we were to write down in a book all the things that he has ever done for us in one day, just one day, we would fill volumes of books in that one day. Now that might be seem impossible to you, but I've tried it. There are so many things that happen in one day that if you pay attention to where he is at, what he is doing, you would be shocked at how much he accomplishes in your life in watching over you, in helping you, in speaking to you, in walking with you, and talking with you. You'd be surprised. It is it is unbelievable when you stop and just sit down and ponder on it. Just think about it. I know that I have given many uh, testimony, but I still have many, many more. Because what I've given you so far is nothing compared to what he has put through and done in my life. But I know that that is the way it is with your life. I want, first of all, everyone to remember that has children. That is your first call. Everyone that has a husband or a wife, that is your first call. If you do not have enough of love in Jesus Christ for those, you will never have enough for others, never. God is love. There's no doubt about it. There's no two ways about it. There's no debating it. There's no trying to understand it. It's a basic truth. And Corinthians 13 tells you exactly what love is. I know recently, and please don't put a name, don't put your name there when I say something that you think I'm talking about you because it's not necessarily so. But I know there is a person that had said to me, well, I had been thinking about going into Corinthians 13, but I put that aside to study another book. And I was studying in this book. Well, there's several ways that you can look up the Word of God and find Jesus to understand him. You know, uh, when I said that I read uh, Matthew 27 times, and, and in all honesty, I can only say, I didn't call me. I didn't say, I'm going to go into Matthew and I'm going to read him seven times, 27 times. I didn't do that. When I read Matthew 27 times in a row, it was because I loved him so much. I searched for him so much. I wanted to see who this man was that loved me. I wanted to find him. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't something that I thought, well, if I do this, I'll get that. I had no idea. I had no understanding for anything, any of it. I only knew that that book opened the door to my heart and told me all about the Son of God. I only know that once I opened that book, 
and began to read, I saw a man who loved me far beyond anything that anybody could ever dream. And the love was unconditional. He didn't love me because I was any good. I, of all the things that I had been through, which many were mental problems, I knew that. I understood. It wasn't because I had anything. And it's the same with you. This is why I'm talking to you this way. This is what I want to give you as a picture. I didn't have uh, churches, uh, doctrines, and problems like that. So it was easy for me to fill up with Jesus Christ. Listen to what I'm telling you. It was easy because I had never stepped foot in a church. I had never stepped foot in coming in contact with people telling me how to do this and how to do that. I came in contact, boom, right off the bat, Jesus Christ. He was the, the, the way God let, the Father led me to him. I came in contact with him. When the Holy Spirit surged through my body, and I mean, he surged like a powerful electricity. And he's done this many times. When he surged through my body like that, there was never a time that he did not do something in my body and mind and spirit. Because that is the way God is. He is, God is, the Holy Spirit is always on the move always doing something. He doesn't come down and you feel his presence for nothing. It doesn't work that way. You don't, you, you go to church and, and you feel the presence of God and you think, oh, he's touched you because you're so good and, and, and you don't understand. When God touches you like that, it's because he wants you to want more of him. He wants you to seek him. He wants you to get to know him. He wants a relationship with you. Contrary to what every single man says, and I'm talking about capital M-E-N, men say, every woman God calls, he loves his handmaidens. He loves those that will sit at his feet and learn. He loves those that will study, that, that will do everything and anything for him. He loves that. He loves that attention, not just from women, but from men. He, he wants that attention. He is like you are. He loves to be pursued. He loves to be chased. And there are times where he will obscure himself, make himself unobtainable because he wants to see how much you are willing to go through to find him. He'll be trying your spirit and you won't even know it. He'll be testing you out to see what you're made of and you won't even know it. And as he does that with you, it is so important for you to understand that you are not called to my calling. You are not, if you have children and you have a husband, you are not called to be out evangelizing or out doing anything. Your first call is to those children. And if it's so impossible to manage, you have to understand you're not called yet. So what is your job if you're not called yet? It's to labor in the Lord in learning how to be a prayer warrior, learning how to use your time wisely with him, learning how and so many things that you can't learn while you're busy. You can't, when you are out there talking to people and thinking you're evangelizing and you you're, think you're doing God's will and you're witnessing and you think you're saving souls, you're not in his will at all because you don't 
Leading a soul to Jesus Christ is a tremendous responsibility. Tremendous. They have to hear the call of the complete truth. They have to hear and be drawn to the, to that truth. And if, if you don't have enough love, enough understanding in Christ, you can't draw them. You can take them a little bit on a little bit of knowledge you know. But where do you go after that? Where do they go after that? I've seen many, many false preachers and teachers drag souls around with them and trying to get Jesus Christ into, into them, trying to get them to work in the church, trying to get them to do this and do that. And that whole time, that person senses, senses the fact that you're a hypocrite. He doesn't know why. He doesn't understand it. But the person that's out there doing this too soon, and you're going to wind up licking your wounds. You're going to wind up because you haven't taken the time to be holy. Righteousness and holiness is something, and it's part of the fruits of the Spirit. And those have to grow. You can't hop, skip, and jump. You can't sit down and learn off of another person. Like, like the person that was asking me all the questions. God's not into that. And how I found out God's not into that is it, it literally drained me. That tells me something's wrong with that spirit. That tells me the person is not just looking to find Jesus. They were looking to use me to obtain for whatever reason they wanted. But there is a corner of the heart that's not honest with them. And, and they, and if you talk to them, they'll say, no, no, I'm not like that. I haven't done that. This is what I want. And they confess over and over what they want. And it's not a true reality. Otherwise, I mean, it drained me so bad, I almost couldn't even make a video. That is just like sucking the life right out of you. I don't let people do that to me. But I had such a compassion on this person that I spent time. Now, it wasn't that person's fault that the Lord tapped me and said, Marion, go, let's go, get off here. And I didn't listen. And then I got the second warning. He said, let's go. Get off of here. And I still didn't listen because she was so fast talking and asking me these questions one after another. And and it's not her fault. It was mine. I don't blame her. But I'm trying to give her a picture of understanding that she's not where she claims. Otherwise, it never would have touched me. It never would have affected me the way it did. It's up to her to go dig out what is in there because something is dreadfully wrong. What you say with your mouth and what you're doing with your heart are two different things. What you said with your mouth about not wanting certain things uh, and that maybe it came from somebody else. No, uh -uh. it's coming from you. I'm not going to lie to anybody. I've gotten too many spankings from the Lord for not telling the truth, for not wanting to say it to them, for not wanting to tell. And God says, if you don't, it's the only way to save them. If you don't tell them, they will never know and they will go on and get worse and worse and worse. And I don't want that to happen. So if anybody has a purpose in their mind, to get in touch with me so that they could listen to me personally and ask me all kinds of questions and just suck the life out of me and go on and do whatever you want to with it because I guarantee you that person is after using all the information I gave her and she's going to use it too soon because she's this isn't right, right here, that heart, it's not right. Jesus didn't, didn't do that. He, when he talked to
to people. He didn't let them drain him. He didn't. I answer comments because you're important to me. I want to know a little bit about who you are. But when you start questioning me to see how you think about this, how you feel, what should I do about this? You take all of those to God, all of them. I'm not God. I can't answer them for you. Well, I need you to pray. I need you to, if I've already instructed you how to pray and, and you said, well, yeah, but it's, Hey, I went through mine. When my, when my daughter was sick, she was about 18 years old. She had, she woke up with a severe pain in her chest. And at that time, I said, said to my husband, I'm taking her to the hospital, the ER. And he thought, hey, you're crazy. It's not that serious. And I said, no, God tells me this is very serious. Get her right away to the hospital. And I did. When I went into the hospital, the ER doctor said, well, you know, she has uh, asthma, whatever. She's going to be all right. We can sit. I said, no, mm -mm. no. I don't know what's wrong with her, but I know it's her lungs. Because he says, oh, no, it can't be her lungs. No. And I said, do something to help her. I am telling you, I know it's her lungs. So he says, okay, because you're the mother and you were that insistent, we will take an x-ray. Well, they did. And there was one lobe of the lung already collapsed completely. And he went, oh my, he was shocked because there was no outward signs of it. By the time we got her into the hospital room, she had severe asthma to begin with. And she had a hard time breathing, but she never knew it. She was phenomenal. She, she didn't go, she just, you never knew it. She just was normal. Nobody ever knew what she suffered. That was the way she was. And so when she went into the, uh, into her room, I decided I was going to stay with her overnight because they were taking her in because of the already the one lung. And that night, in the middle of the night, her temperature rose to 105. She had pneumonia. If I wouldn't have taken her to the hospital, she would have died. They had a nurse right there by her side the whole night watching her breathing. That's how serious her condition was. Now, if I wouldn't have done my due diligence to hear from God, to understand from God, where would my child have been? If I would have been busy in the church evangelizing, if I would have been busy in the church as a Sunday school teacher, or if I would have been busy uh, baking cakes and doing all that stuff, don't tell me about what it's like because I know what it's like. It is so much pressure to get things done for your pastors. It is so much pressure that you have to get at home. You have to hurry up and get this done and hurry up and get that done. And then you hurry up and do that. And then you hurry up and go. And, and you'll run if you have to because you've got to please that pastor. That's not God. Believe me, that's not God. And I say to myself, where would I have been if I would not have listened to Jesus Christ? And I'm not talking about the church. I'm not talking about the pastors. 
They weren't up all night holding her hand. Her mother was. Even the dad didn't know what was wrong with her and thought I was crazy. But I listened to God and I didn't care. Even the doctor insisted I didn't know what I was talking about. But I listened to God. When you could hear God like that for your children, I didn't run to a pastor for prayer. I didn't run to anybody. I didn't say, we have to have an agreement in prayer. You've got to pray for my daughter right now. You've got to do this and you've got to do that. Uh uh. Nope. I knew God was the only one that can help me. And I wasn't running to anybody but him. He taught me that from the very beginning. There is nobody here that's going to help you the way he helps you. And when you run to other people to help you, you're not learning your lessons. You're trying to jump over them. You don't, the flesh does not want to take the time to be holy. The flesh does not want to take the time to be righteous. They don't. They want to be, the flesh wants to say, I've got Jesus Christ and I could tell the whole world how to do it. And, and I'll hear them tell me, well, I'm already starting a, a video and I'm making my own. Will you go right ahead? But I guarantee you, if you are not ready, you are going to have some serious problems because you must be ready. Now, if it took me all the years that it took me to be ready and, and what God would tell me is, is, Marion, you see this one over here that you didn't want to be a pastor because of what he did. And you didn't want to be a pastor or a preacher or a teacher because this what this woman was doing, what that one was doing. He says, you know what they did? They ran ahead of me. They did not want to take the time to hear from me, to understand me, to do what I asked them to do. And so they ran ahead of me and every last one of them wound up in sin and wound up in trouble. Because once you cross a line with God, once you literally run ahead and say, I, because you, somewhere, somehow, the teaching of the gospel was everybody is a minister. Not true. Absolutely not true. It's a false teaching. Everybody is not called to be a minister the way they're talking about. There is such a lack of understanding. You're a minister to your family first. I mean your whole family. If you cannot take care of your whole family spiritually, you cannot take care of anybody else. If you can't have victory to see them saved, you can't anybody else. It's impossible. It truly is impossible. Now, if you have in-laws that want no parts of God in you and, and they never want nothing to do with you, they have it all, they know it all. I don't count that as my family. I count the ones like my brothers, my sister, my, uh, my daughter. The, that's my family. Those that don't want God in me is not my family. That's their problem. So if you have people like that in your life and you're wasting your time with them, trying to get them in, that's not your family. Your first family is your own, own, very own household. That is your first family. You know, in the end of, towards the end of my husband's and my life, uh, you know, me 79 and him 85 yesterday. The family that he knows ever calls him, rarely ever calls him, talks to him, anything. They're busy about their own lives. Mine always checks on me. They always want to know how I'm doing. The, on, the ones that are left check on me. And there's just... Two. Those that are capable of checking on me, the other is too old. The others are too old to do that. They can barely check on themselves. And I think the problem with my husband's family is they're all old. 
They're all older than him. So they can't check on us either. I'm not telling you to desert your family if they're in-laws. I'm, I'm not saying that to you. Don't twist my words. Don't twist up what I'm saying to suit your own avenue of life. Listen to what I'm saying if you have to listen to it again. Your own household is your immediate family. That is your wife and your children or your husband and your children. That is your immediate family. They are the most important in your life. Because one day as you get older, you're going to need them. You're going to need that spouse that you think doesn't please you now. You're going to need that one. How are you going to get them to help you and be good to you and kind to you? Huh? How are you going to do that? How, how is that going to happen when you fight with them and you get upset with them and, and you don't like what they've done and you... Oh, you just wish to God, God would remove them and, or maybe he would deliver you. I've been there. I did all that years ago. I know exactly the path you take because I've been there. I've done that. And I know what God told me then. And he tells me the same thing now. When you're wrong, you're wrong. And you need to own up to it. That you're not the perfect one in the family. You're not the only one that can have God. You're not the only one that knows everything and anything. And you can even say, well, they don't read the Bible and they don't. So what? So what? If you know so far much more than that, then why? Why have you not shown the love? The love that goes beyond their faults and sees their needs. Why have you not been in the place of constantly watching over them in prayer? Are they safe? You know, when you get older, your your husband leaves the house or your wife leaves the house and they go somewhere and you take it for granted. Oh, they're gone. That's, that's okay. Maybe they'll enjoy themselves. And it never occurs to you to pray for them. Never occurs to you to trust God for their safety. Never think for a minute they might be an accident. Never think for a minute they might fall. You know, there's there's not a time that my husband goes outside and I don't go check on him often. I want to know that he's all right. And there's not a time that I could lay in his bed sick that he doesn't check on me. That's love. That's not that's not uh, physical chemical love. That's that's not that. It's it's agape love. It's godly love. And you're going to need that one day, so you better practice at it now. You better practice at being that way now. <clears throat> if you have children and you long to have a rest from being with them, you're not doing them a bit of good. You really aren't. Because you're taking care of them in yourself. When you do something with your children, and you do it as unto the Lord. Do everything that you do with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And when you, you do that, you never feel it. Do you know that? You never feel how many hours you've done it. You never feel it. But if you're in the flesh, you're going, Oh, I can't wait till this is over. I have to play with her and do that. And I have to do this. You're not even enjoying your child. When you have real love there, you love that child so much you'd do anything to be with them. Because you don't realize one day you may be without them the way I am. One day they may die before you. At this stage, you may feel overwhelmed. It's just so overwhelming for me to have to do all of this, for me to try to accomplish all of this. Well, if I was in those shoes, I would take a rest in God. I would sit down and talk to God and ask him to help me to overcome one at a time. One at a time. Just like you take yourself, have a, a wee bit of organization in the whole thing. Have a wee bit of a plan. I'm not saying you have to follow it to a T, 
but have a plan. The mornings are the times that the Lord talks to people. He loves to walk and talk in the morning. He tells you clearly with Adam and Eve. He loves to walk and talk in the morning. Ah, the freshness of your day, the freshness of your life waking up. Because by the end of the day, you're too tired to think of anything. If you've done diligently all of what you're supposed to do, you might be too tired. I go in the middle of the night because it takes me clear into the morning. I do that because it's so quiet. And you have to pick out a time that's quiet for you, where you can hear him. Where you can, you can grasp fully what he's saying to you. You can take everything I say as a heavy burden. Oh, I just felt this heaviness. Well, rebuke it. Because that's not what God's putting on, a heavy burden. You're not doing that. You're thinking it is. You're just going, oh, I got this and this, this is just too much for me. No, it's not. Nothing is too much for you. Everything that you need to do is not overwhelming or too much unless you let it be. I told you, and I'll say it again, the devil has no power over you unless you give it to him. And it's your thinking and how you feel that tells you and tells you where you're at. Now, I, I know <laughs> my newfound friend, she's got a lot of wisdom. When she felt getting to be a little bit heavy for her. She completely stopped it and, and, and rested until she became her normal self, which may have taken maybe a half an hour, may have taken a day. I don't know. I didn't talk to her about it. But I'm trying to explain to you, this is what you need to do. These are the things that will really, really help you grow. And that's what I'm after, is to help you grow in Christ. 